<laughs> Hello. I'm the Grub Street Lodger. Uh, uh, it's kind of sunny, which doesn't seem a surprise for July, I know, but it's been a really, really wet July. Uh, this has been a very Proustie month. Uh, so, I oh, read... Oh, God, I need to not do that because it's bonga, 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 isn't it? So I read The Gamantes Way. Um, this is the third sort of book of uh, In Search of Lost Time, or as mine is Remembrance of Things Past because I've got the, uh, the the old Scott Moncrief translation. And um, what happens in this one, he's... he's of an age, I can never quite work out how old he is. I think he's about 16, 17. Um, and he falls in love with the Duchess of Gamantes. So his family have moved into the building owned by the Duchess of Gamantes, and they're kind of neighbours. Um, and so he does the kind of thing he always seems to do. He stalks her and follows her about and, and thinks creepy thoughts about her. Um, and she doesn't like it. <laughs> And then he goes to Robert St. Luke, I say his friend, but he admits even in the book, he's only my friend because I can get things out of him. Which, yeah, that's very him. Uh, and he tries to get an introduction to the Duchess and doesn't get it. And then he gets bored of chasing her. And when he gets bored of chasing her, that means that all of a sudden she's interested in meeting him and invites him over. Uh, and she and her husband are very, very... Uh, eager to have him for things and I don't really know why because I don't know what the narrators bring into a party it doesn't <laughs> it doesn't appeal to me very much it's uh what 3,000 pages through this thing now and even though I quite enjoy it and I'm enjoying the book I really don't like the narrator character I think he's a horrible weird creepy oily snivelly pathetic two-faced um Git. I don't like him at all, so but yeah, she seems to really like his company. And and so then we have big long chunks where uh, kind of as we've had before, he, he gets he's not disappointed this time, but he realizes that the, the thing he was imagining and the thing he was dreaming was not true. So he was imagining the Duchess of Gamantes to have this wonderfully uh elevated life and to be amongst all these wonderfully elevated people and and then in the course of a, a dinner party that takes 200 pages uh, he realizes that they're just as uh, venial and pathetic and boring and stuff as everybody else <laughs> and that's that's the book um i say some of the chapters are 200 odd pages long uh one was i think 300 odd and it's you know the main set pieces in it are a trip to the theater uh, and a dinner party um, and it's funny because in some ways the best bits of the Proust books are where he's sort of contemplating and thinking and and meditating uh, the, the woozy bits, the dozy bits he's very good at writing about feeling sleepy which I currently am because I've just woken up from a nap um, and things like that but this is a book which has well, I say action, but it has characters doing things in it for a lot of it. So it's actually a much easier, quicker read. And I don't know whether it's because I'm, I'm, you know, that far into these books now that they've, uh, they've got me, or I don't know. I'm finding them quite enjoyable, but I still don't like the narrator. Um, oh, and there's one bit. So there's this guy called Baron de Charlos or Baron de Charlot or whatever you know, French day. Weird pronunciations. And uh, he's obviously being a bit odd about him. He keeps inviting him over and then being disappointed. And uh, and I, I sort of thought, oh, maybe he's trying to groom him or something. I don't know. So then it cuts to... I've got the... They're called Cities of the Plain, my versions, but uh, they're usually um, Sodom and Gomorrah. Uh and we discovered that Baron Charles is a sodomite or an invert. He is gay, uh, which leads to about 85 pages of just sort of musings about how terrible it must be to be gay, which is kind of funny because it's written by Proust, who is gay. Uh, and so he's trying to pretend, oh, those terrible people, they're evil and they have terrible vices. How bad of them. 
and it's not really coming across, especially because in this, his his love of Albertine really comes out, and it's clear that Albertine is just Albert. <laughs> that Albertine is not really a woman, but is being a woman in this. Um, and, uh, yeah, so Brown Charles was trying to groom him, essentially, and not very good at it. And we see lots of bits of uh, Brown Charles being really quite obvious once you know uh, there's, there's a big party at the beginning and then uh, a very grand party and then later on there's a a party with the middle class rising salon set and and yeah once once you know it's really obvious essentially um but this isn't just a book about sodomy oh no it's also a book about gomorrahy um because he's really worried that albertine is a bit too close to women than he would like uh, and that when he's da- when when Albertine she's dancing with her her girlfriends, uh, she's not just dancing cheek to cheek but breast to breast, and she likes it too much. And so he's well, he's getting jealous uh, and bitter and things. Uh, and this increases his love because in this book, all basically all love is illusion. Um, you you love a creation that you have created of your beloved kind. Um, no one actually knows the person they love. They just they just love their own image of them. So when I uh, yeah, so I finished that and it's uh, volume eight um, of my you know, chopped up. The reason I'm reading this old translation is because it's chopped up into twelve paperback volumes. So much easier to read. Uh, so I'm on eight out of twelve. So I'll finish that by the end of the year. Um, I might even read another you know two books which is four volumes next next month i don't know yet but uh, a little breaks in between proust's i read basho on love and barley and this is this guy called basho basho is a pen name it means banana tree uh and he writes haiku and it's just lots of haiku and they're lovely they're really nice there's something a good haiku does manage to capture something more. A bad haiku is just some syllables in a row. So this one just says, uh, year's end, still in straw hat and sandals. And it's like, oh, okay, he's poor, so he's still in his straw hat and his sandals. I kind of get that. You know, it's, it's winter and he's not wearing the right clothes. So there is a bit there, but, but this one more, loneliness, caged cricket dangling from the wall. Oh, yeah, no, that says quite a bit more. And then there are other bits which, I don't know, he just manages to say more than he's saying, which I think is very, very Im- impressive. And there's, I like this one, Town Merchants, who will buy this hat lacquered with snow? And that's that's good. And then this is the one he wrote just before he died. Sick on a journey over parched fields, dreams wander on. And so he wandered on. And, yeah, I enjoyed those haiku. Um yeah, it was good. And if you read them in that kind of... If you read them in that Zen approach. Uh, but you, you try and grasp this is eternity in a moment kind of idea. It's it's quite meaningful. It's 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 not as daft as it sounds. Um, the next book I read was The Wind and the Willows by Kenneth Graham. I read it when I was nine and I didn't enjoy it. And so now I'm 39. And I thought, let's try it again. Because whenever I come up to bits of it, I think I might enjoy it. So let's give it a whack. I did this in the best way. On the first day of the summer holidays, I went to the count- country park. I keep calling it county park. Country park. And I sat there for four hours, three and a half hours. As long as it took to read the book through on a bench by a by a lake listening to birds and walkers, but mainly birds, and the wind through the rushes, which was the original name of Wind in the Willows. And it was lovely. And what's great is there's this very domestic, cosy quality to it. You know, all the the big picnics and um, the details of the dimples on the galoshes and the, you know, the sort of friendship and um, all this kind of stuff. And then there's a deep weirdness and strangeness to it. the weird levels of anthropomorphism. The fact that repeatedly Toad brushes his hair. What hair does Toad have? Uh, 
the the yeah the relationship between animals and people the the bit where ratty is almost hypnotized to go traveling and, and mole snaps him out of it and we're not even convinced exactly that that's the best thing um the the, the piper in the gates of dawn where they find the god and oh, it's just this beautiful bit where ratty's almost crying with the beauty of it all and then the the god has sort of wiped a memory so he can't remember why he's crying and it's yeah weird and strange and beautiful and very much celebrating being a bachelor and and, and male company like that it's it's very much these these little bachelor animals none of them have wives um or would want to uh though i'm sure mole and rat are gay because i mean they cohabit at least half the year as well but it's it's yeah this this wonderful combination between very uh cozy and homelike and very weird and alien uh, the the works it gives it this tension that was yeah i remember it as being boring as a kid and it wasn't boring and it was frequently sweet and also just frequently strange that was good now the next book i read i'm not even gonna write in my description i've not written it on the goodreads it's called the peer it's by john messingham the reason I'm not writing is because he hasn't got any reviews on Goodreads. I met him at a writer's gathering and bought the book because I like because the, the it's set that it's a well you can tell by the yellow writing it's a murder mystery, uh, and the body is found hanging underneath the local pier here. I thought well that'd be fun a bit of local local murder mystery, um, so I bought it from him and I'll probably see him again at things, and. Um, I've got nothing good to say about the book. So uh, in terms of Goodreads, I've, I've not said it. And even in terms of this, I don't want him to Google it because, well, uh, apart from it might be awkward if I meet him again, I just, I don't want him to find out. <laughs> I don't want him to find out there's just nothing good about this book. From just pure um, sentence construction, the, the tenses are all over the place to the fact that there's no characterization everyone talks like a robot to the plot is very obvious and if you don't get the murderer because there's only seven characters named characters um and it's not going to be any of the policemen it's not going to be the two obvious um two obvious suspects it's going to be well i thought it was the mother-in-law and then she was kidnapped and i was like oh who else is there oh yeah they mentioned the name of a boss it must be him and it was him uh, and there's no characterization and there's no place there's no sense of place so the th reason i wanted this and was thought yeah let's give it a go was because i thought it'd be fun to read a murder mystery set here with all these places but the pier not only is the pier never named but one of the key features of the pier is the only building on it is a very large fish and chip shop indeed the biggest in the world they claim uh, and so it stinks of fish and chips around there uh, and this is never mentioned. There's no details like this. It's just, in fact, the thing that's described the most are things like people getting in and out of cars or people opening doors or people putting filing in cabinets. Um, no one has a personality. Nothing is there. And it just it just sounds really childish, like a kid wrote it. Um, uh, yeah. The police car that Brighton was in had made its way through town and was now parked up along the pier alongside the other two police cars that had passed her a few moments before. Uh, Brighton got out of the car and walked towards a concrete ramp to the left of the pier entrance which led down to the beach area and the underside of the pier. And that's actually one of the most descriptive parts of the book. And weirdly, I was sitting on that concrete pier last week, so I know exactly what they're talking about. But, yeah. If I can give him any props, he seems to know the procedure, which... <laughs> damages the book because um it makes it more boring because <laughs> it makes it just seem everyday and humdrum and procedural uh, and the cover though pretty generic is quite nicely done that's the only thing good things i've got to say about that sorry okay the last thing i read uh, a lion was learning to ski by ranjit bolt so what it was was i got 10 pound book voucher I went there to Waterstones. I found a book I liked for £9. 
And then I had a little scrabble around in the uh, in the clearance section to find a book for pound because I was like, I'm not keeping that card with one pound on it. So I got this, and it's limericks. It's limericks by a playwright called Ranjit Bol. Uh, some of them are good, some of them are bad. Uh, <laughs> I looked him up, and uh, apparently he wrote these and sold them in Cambridge Market because he, he had such bad gambling debts, and people liked them. So, so he ended up publishing them. That's a good one. I like this one. A costiff young lady from Crewe had a naiad who lived in a loo. And each time she'd deposit, a voice from the closet cried, Is that the best you can do? So yeah, it's, it's just limericks. Um, I think the original asking price of £10 is crazy. I would never pay £10 for this. I, I, I still think £1 was you know, pushing it a bit. There's also the fact that, that I think Ranjit Bolt must slur his words even more than I do. Because... Especially on the second line of the limericks, they don't always fit. <laughs> and it's like, no, you must have slurred that together because that actually doesn't fit the limerick tune. Um, can I find one? I bet you I can't now. But, um, yeah, where, uh, well, that's the best one, actually. Um, here's the best one. It is not common knowledge but Spooner, when he died at a restaurant in Pune, or did one Kevsamani, a Bam Liriani, Dan Charl and a hot bikin tuna? That one's a good one. That one's a good one. But there are a few of these where, especially the second line, uh, long ago in Provence an old man owned an apples and pears by Cezanne. That one's all right. Uh, there once was a man from Bombay who's appalling this blue one away. That one's okay too. I can't find one that doesn't work now. When the empire was still fairly young, in the spirit from whence it was sprung, yeah, I can't, I can't find one now. There was a number of times where I thought, "Hang on, that doesn't quite fit." Uh, yeah, it was good. It was just about a pound's worth of pleasure. I wouldn't charge ten pound for it. Uh, anyway, so that's um, that's the month's reading. Uh, mainly Proust, with a few other little bits just sprinkled in. And August, I think, is probably going to be quite similar as well. Uh, in which I'll probably finish Proust and have a few of those sprinkled in things too. Anyway, I've got summer holidays, so I'm going to be mooching and enjoying uh, uh, and sitting outside and reading and just having a good time. See ya.